No matter how poorly a person provides emotionally or financially uh, in your life, the first victory for a man is that he didn't quit. Because most of the people suffering in this room are suffering from a life you knew nothing about. The, the, some of them don't know who their father is. Some of them were abused by their fathers. Some of their fathers ran away. And the child thinks that the father ran from them. But the, in all likelihood, the, the father either ran from your mother. <laughs> no, that's true. He, 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 he ran from the relationship that was going on with her at the time or he ran from the pressure of being this iconic individual that was intimidating for this 20-year-old or this 25-year-old individual who, who is unfinished himself, who is flawed and broken, and, and the whole family unit is predicated on the fact it has to be a place of unconditional love. It has to be because God isn't through raising anybody in the house. Anybody in the house. And it's very important that you understand that because if you don't give that elasticity to a man, he will leave. He will leave for the lack of uh, being understood and being received because he wants everything you want. Everything you just said that you want, that's everything I want. I want to be seen. I want to be valued. I want to be affirmed. I want to be appreciated. And I want it, I want it to happen after work. And so in between all of that, that's everything your mother wants. So everybody wants. So you come home to hunger, tired. So when you come home to hunger, tired, and, and, and face criticism, which I didn't, but some men do, it makes you want to flee either back to work or away altogether. To the grieving women in this room who feel like my father loved, didn't love me, he wasn't there for me, very seldom do men leave their children. They leave their situation or they leave their spouse and they don't know how to build a relationship with the child apart from the mother, or the mother won't let them. So you mentioned elasticity. And <laughs> we got somebody hollering some out there. <laughs> and we're, like, how do you balance not wanting to be like overcritical and nagging or judgmental, but also having legitimate, you know, things that you want to be able to discuss, whether it's in the father relationship or even a relationship with a husband. Time, with men, timing is everything. Timing is everything. It is not what you say, it's when you say it. Not when I first come in the door. Don't meet me at the door with a bunch of complaints. I'm trying to find some refuge. I'm trying to find some peace. And men, and most men, uh, need a cave, a detox spot to, to refuel from all the things that happened to you at work, where you were often belittled, mistreated, hated on, ostracized, and to survive that and come home and run it. The persons you're doing it for have a list of what you didn't do. It makes you feel unappreciated. And here's where the problem comes in. There's always somebody around the corner talking to you, saying, if, if you was my man, and I was your woman. And, 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 it's, and it, it's really not true, but it is the trap we fall in because we have a tendency to go to where the claps are, not the criticisms. If you do have something critical to say, pick a time that your emotions are not involved in it because you have to understand uh, 
men don't, whether in the workplace or at home or uh, in life, we don't communicate like women. We communicate very differently. And so understanding what you mean is a process. My, your mother would tell you my famous line with your mother, my famous, famous all time 37 year old, there has never been a year in the 37 years we've been married that I didn't say this at least a hundred times during the year. What do you mean by that? <laughs> because what she said and what I heard are often two completely different things. And the same thing is true in reverse. What, what I said versus what you hear is two different things. I might say, I don't like your dress, and you might hear, I don't like you. We, we can compartmentalize one issue from the other and, and speak about the issue and then wonder why the individual is mad. Because for us, it's about the issue. It's not about the individual. But the woman often feels affronted, A. B, most women grew up without a man, so she wants me to be her girlfriend in pants. <laughs> she, she talks to me like she want a girl, and she receives from me like a woman communication. Male communication is very different. It, it, yeah, because like when PT talks to me, mm -hmm. I can't hardly take it sometimes. It's like way direct and like, well, why did you, what were you thinking when you did that? And then I become defensive and now I have an attitude. And even though I grew up in the house with a man, I think there's something about him saying something that suggests I didn't do it well enough mm -hmm. that maybe brings up this little girl who wanted to please her dad. Mm -hmm. And so now it's not just him saying I didn't do this one thing well. I hear all of these things that I didn't do well throughout our relationship. Relationship. The first mistake is you married your father. I, I didn't know that until about six months into it, and that's when I realized that they're the same people. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I tell you, it's, it's amazing how much we think alike. Uh, being direct for us isn't always an attack. Let me show you the opposite of it. When, when a woman comes home to talk to her husband, she says, uh, he wants to know what's for dinner. Well, I left work, I knew we didn't have any green beans. I had to go by the store and get some green beans. The traffic was absolutely everywhere. Do you not know that I had to go to Kroger's where they got green beans, five cans for a dollar, and wait in line? I ran into Helen while I was there, and you know I don't like Helen. And he's sitting there just, you want to take your lip and pull it completely over top of your head? Because all I want to know is... So, so psychology teaches that, that, that women circle around the issue. You circle around the issue. We, we, we come down like a helicopter right on the issue. A machete. I like to call it a machete. A machete. <laughs> We're your protectors. But this is it. A direct, a direct statement from me doesn't necessarily mean I'm angry at all. Doesn't necessarily mean I'm angry at all. And so when you get angry and defensive, I feel misunderstood. I got a big amen, I heard it come from the first. I, I, I feel misunderstood. Uh, the, the three men that are in this room are praying hard for me, okay? So what, what you have to understand is that I, I feel misunderstood by just being straightforward with you. And, 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 and let me say this as it relates to marriage. You can get married in 30, you, you, can, you can have a wedding in 30 minutes, but it takes 30 years to have a marriage. <laughs> By the time you learn how to read each other, <laughs> you have raised your children. <laughs> 
You have buried your parents. You have been in every conceivable situation together and you have drawn conclusions. And the reason that this is so difficult, that it starts generationally and passes down, you, you already have the advantage of having some sense how to read them. And you know how you and I can talk across the room and never say a word, okay? I can talk to this girl and never part my lips. We would look at each other and burst out and start laughing and had and said a word to each other. That innate instinct is very helpful in reading your husband even though sometimes you read that he's displeased with you uh, because he said, criticized something that you did. But it's funny that you would say that about him because with me, though I am direct, and we've had our moments, look at the way she's looking at me. <laughs> One of my greatest father-daughter moments with you was after you were started to write and you wrote me something and sent it to me and I was in LA at the time and I was busy and I was very direct and I, I'm embarrassed how direct I was. I tell you, it wasn't good. And I didn't know what you meant. You needed to write it over. <laughs> I did. When, she, when you later wrote the book, I called you. I was called you from my desk and I left a message of your voicemail. And I said, I was gonna read the book because I've always been their guinea pigs. Anything they cooked, I ate. Anything they, they wrote, I read. So I said, I'm gonna read this book because you're my child. But when I started reading it, it was so well written and so well done, I couldn't put it down. The pace, the rhythm, the truth, the storytelling, the description was impeccable. And then you taught me something. You called me crying. And you said, I want to keep this message forever. Uh. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> and, and you said something to me that I will never forget. You said, because this girl is extremely deep. She's real deep. She said, what gave your compliment so much validity is the criticism that preceded it. The fact that you had the courage to tell me when I was wrong makes me believe you when you tell me I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> 